downtown Boston. This is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. Now, here's Jeff. Thank you, Ron, and good afternoon, Americans, and welcome to the Jeff Santos Show. We are live in Studio A here in the south coast of Massachusetts on this uh, Tuesday edition of the Jeff Santos Show. It is the uh, 14th of April, 2020. We've got a great program for you. We're going to do something a little bit different today as we tackle where Bernie and the progressive movement go after not only an uh, endorsement, uh, but pulling out of the race last week and the endorsement yesterday. But a lot of ideas uh, floating around that a lot of young Bernie people are not going to go to the uh, to the Joe Biden campaign. We'll get into all of that with our guest today. Mark Taylor Canfield will join us, get his perspective from a lot of the young uh, Seattleites who are for Bernie. And, of course, he won that handily in 2016. Not so much in 2020. We'll also get some uh, catching up on some of the music uh, that uh, Mark has been dealing with and the differences between Europe and America when how they treat musicians and the investment that they make for artists in general. Coming up at uh, 3.30, we're trying to really get an idea on MFA and Medicare for All. Nobody better than Wendell Potter president of business for Medicare for All, and of course, uh, the whistleblower from Aetna and Cigna, and uh, also uh, the founder of Tarbell.org, a great website, folks, check it out. At 4 o'clock, Melissa Tomlinson will get a perspective here. Now with Bernie out of the race, we'll wrap it up with Robert Craig, which will take some phone calls for him today. Of course, the executive director of Wisconsin Citizen Action. And uh, we'll get a perspective from him on where does the progressive movement go? Where Where is this, uh, you know, Bernie all of a sudden love fest with Joe Biden? What does it mean the behind the scenes? Ask again, the phone number to join is 844-713-3459, 844-713-3459. You can email me, jeff at revolutionboston.com. Check us out on both uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, at Jeff Santos Show. All right, our next guest, he's our renaissance man, Mr. 206, the area code of Seattle. A great musician, you hear his works right now. And, of course, he is... Uh, the great Democracy Watch News is his baby, along with Mr. Edwards. And, uh, of course, every Tuesday, usually at 5.30, but today a little bit different. We try to do two hours and get all of our great folks in. Mr. Mark Taylor Canfield in his classic edition here. Mark, great to have you on. How you doing, my friend? I am good, Jeff. Uh pretty sleep deprived uh i'm glad you're playing my quarantine suit there that's part of the reason that i've been sleep deprived because we were working really hard to get the first movement done but uh and then this morning there was a conference call with democracy watch news with our reporter in india where everything is locked down like it is here but in general um i'm okay this is i was supposed to say this i guess mark taylor campbell reporting for duty and <laughs> live from seattle live from the emerald city where the wizards you know, behind the curtain are definitely, you know, definitely Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. But, you know, we're hanging in there. They're, they're back there behind the curtains. Am I, and I know we, we should talk about, you know, music and things, but I just have to make this statement about the difference between <laughs> Bernie Sanders and... Well, yeah, I want to get to that. I, I want to get to that. Go, go right ahead. Make your opening statement. Then I want to ask you some questions. quote. Well, to me, it's kind of like... The difference between champagne and Coca-Cola. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, you got the good stuff, the authentic stuff, the stuff that took, you know, a lot of really intricate preparation and intelligence and a good heart at working with the soil and making it grow just right and the right amount of sun and temperature and everything. And then you got the Coca-Cola, which is kind of mass, you know, manufactured, cheap stuff that anybody can get anywhere. That's all I'm saying. Okay, well that's that's a good one. I, I purposely I don't like either. Um, I am a um, 
more Pepsi than I am Coke, uh, and I am uh, more red wine than I am white wine or champagne. And uh, one of these days, I'll tell you about some of my experiences with champagne in college. It's not a good, not a good sight. But anyways, I think that that's an interesting analogy because one is more real and the other one is as phony as can be. And we all know the chemicals that go into Coca-Cola. Um, all right, so. I'm interested because you're one of our youngest contributors, uh, number one, and a lot of youthful, a lot of, a lot of people who are under, say, the age of 40 were Bernie's backbone. Now, a lot of them are basically saying, screw this, I'm not going to uh, go with uh, Joe Biden. In fact, Brianna Joy Gray, who was the press secretary to Bernie Sanders' campaign, says, that's not me either. So there are a lot of people who are quite dissatisfied. There are people within the campaign itself that I've heard from via text that are infuriated that Bernie A. dropped out. And now that he endorsed yesterday... Uh, I'm wondering what you're hearing from a lot of the the folks that are part of the Seattle intelligentsia, if you might, came out in massive numbers at that uh, event four years ago uh, at the Mariners' ballpark. And then, of course, Tacoma Dome, 20,000 people there just a month before the primary. What What is the feeling you're getting? I don't have any reports of this or evidence, but I suspect that there may, be an, may have been a few damaged um, computer monitor screens the morning that people got up, like me. I got a text message saying, Bernie Sanders wants to talk to Betty at 11.45 a.m. And I thought, no, not now. Yeah, I was, I was afraid. But, you know, and I'm not trying to be really cynical here, although I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm not happy with that decision. Um, but let's just face it, you know, and I've been writing about this, that mainstream U.S. corporate media and politics is currently much too conservative to tolerate a Democratic Socialist or a candidate for, for U.S. president, at least. So maybe, I don't know, in eight years, 12 years after young folks can take over the media and the Democratic Party or form their own independent movement, I'm, I'm not sure, Jeff. I mean... I know this movement is much bigger than Bernie Sanders, so it's not going to go away. And there are plenty of people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, our own Pramila Jayapal, who, who will be out there as progressive fighters and can look forward to people running for office with Bernie's Bernie crack kind of platform. We've already seen it influence modern media through the last you know, two presidential elections. But I just am thinking that the majority of U.S. voters are folks over the age of 45, and they do hold kind of what I would call conservative, anti-progressive 20th century style opinions about national politics. And as a result of that, we have a sharply divided country and a sharply divided political party, which leads to this extreme generation gap between the young folks in the party and those over 40, 45. And unfortunately, what it leaves us with is the fact that the Republicans are going to continue to receive most of their support from men in the country, and when majority of the women will support the Democrats, but the younger generation are just going to be left out of it because they don't have anyone to represent them right now, even though they continue to be open to these new ideas about economic and environmental rights, and they'll be supportive of democratic socialist policies these policies that their uninformed elders find so offensive, you know. So that'll continue, but there has to be a younger candidates to pick up the banner and run with it because people well, need that kind of representation. We'll get into this a little bit later, too, talking with our great friend, the Renaissance man, Mark Taylor Canfield, here on the Jeff Santos Show. And again, we'll open up the phones when we talk to Robert Craig. Uh, and others as we uh, move on to the uh, to the rest of the show. But, Mark, I am of, of two minds here. I'm also uh, annoyed being a Bernie Sanders person who's over the age of 50, who is frustrated by the DNC and the real lockdown of voters uh, against Bernie, the voter suppression in California that Greg Palast outlined for us, the voter suppression that AOC and Bernie himself talked about in Michigan, the problems that probably were created by the Republicans who wanted no part of the Bernie movement that held people back till 10, 11 o'clock at night in Texas. Bernie lost that race by four points. 
So it just seems to me that there are some some concerns here. On the other hand, Bernie did a very bad job of trying to connect the older voters. He didn't have to get all of them, but to get some of them. He never did the FDR thing to the, to the extent he, sh he should have. Never talked about it. Always had younger people behind him. Never anybody with gray hair sitting behind him at these rallies. He focused primarily to talking to young progressives, but there are a lot of people who are African Americans who may be uh, economically just uh, as liberal as he would like, but not necessarily culturally, and again, he didn't do much to help in that regard either. So there's plenty of blame to go around, but I'm thinking that if it's not Bernie, then where does the progressive movement in the immediate go? Is Elizabeth Warren uh, going to be the choice after she kneecapped our friend uh, Bernie Sanders? Uh, what, are you, what are you hearing? What are yours? thoughts on that well there is some hope i mean there is some things going on that are more of a movement than a candid candidate's campaign but there is the declaration of democracy which is a coalition of 145 groups that are all dedicated to saving what's what's left of our democratic republic and that movement has resulted in introduction of a bill H.R. 1 in the U.S. Congress, which addresses some of those current challenges to our democracy, including vote suppression, gerrymandering, and all the rest. So we definitely have to deal with these issues that have ruined the electoral process so that only billionaires can run for office. And we also have, of course, this other issue with the mainstream U.S. corporate media, which is yep. currently way too conservative to tolerate democratic socialism, and so just lost their cool completely when Bernie Sanders was the front runner in that race. There's Mike Gravel, former Senator Mike Gravel that we interviewed at Democracy Watch News the other day. He has this idea of a people's legislature where he's saying, you know, if, if our elected representatives aren't going to listen to us, then we got to organize ourselves. And in some degree, that's going to have to happen on every level, whether it's your city council or your, your local school board or whatever. And that grassroots kind of movement has to continue right there at the local level. But for the moment, unfortunately, I wouldn't expect a free college education or universal health care. But you can bet that there will be big increases in the military budgets and tax breaks for the top 1%. And that's just where the money goes. You know, we, we've seen during this crisis where... People are finally you know, open to the idea of, well, subsidies, maybe, you know, these small businesses need a help, you know, they need a bailout, they need help, but not just Chase and Bank of America, but my local, you know, barbershop or whatever. So people are finally starting to think differently. And, and, and that's another subject that, you know, I was hoping we could talk about, too, is just the difference in some of the, the mentality towards... Uh, just the everyday person and government yeah. and the arts. Well, I, I think, think I... This next question leads into it. We're talking with Mark Taylor Canfield here on the Jeff Santos Show. I believe that one of the ways the progressive movement can really take off here is that they need not more senators, more lawyers, more Congress people, uh, you know, more business people. We've had enough of them. They, they have failed us for the most part. Um, I think we need more artists. And I think we need more artists that are in the world of music, in the world of uh, acting. And I'm not talking about uh, the Kim Kardashians of the world or the latest uh, airhead that is uh, one hit wonder and, and so forth. I'm talking about the Mark Ruffalo's. I'm talking about the Bruce Springsteen's. I'm talking about people who have some soul. And they're also, for the most part, uh, you know, you, you can throw in Kuzak and all these others out there. Uh, these, these folks have money. So you don't have to go trolling with uh, McDonald's cup in hand, you know, to Wall Street like all of these candidates do in both parties. I don't know about you, but I think that, you know, your experience that you've outlined for me is that musicians, and I would say, if you think about the British actors, they're all knighted by the Queen, are taken a lot more seriously than the folks here in the United States. I think it's different in Europe, and I know you've had some experiences on that, and I think that this might be a future. Your thoughts? Well, just to give people a quick background, I mean, before I became a, a rock and roller guy, or actually I've always loved rock and roll, but I was trained as a classical musician on classical guitar and then took music theory in college and ended up in Europe. Um, my music was recognized at in some international competitions, and... 
So I ended up going to Europe and getting a grant from an institution there in Bourges, France, to do some traveling and things and see my work presented in competition and at concerts. There was also, by the way, this, we can talk about this some other time, but there was a big recruitment competition going on at the University of Washington over me because the physics department wanted me to work at the particle accelerator, the cyclotron particle accelerator, because I was into science, but the computer music director, Richard Carpin, wanted me to go to this to the music school and be a resident composer there. So I ended up choosing to become a composer instead, ended up in Europe, and I found like right away that the way that people treat artists there is very different from in the United States. And my kind of spiel on this, you know, I have one about what it's like to visit people in New York, what it's like to do this or that. Well, there's, here's mine about what happens to you when you go to France, especially. You're walking down the streets and you meet someone. They ask you what you do for a living. You tell them you're an artist. They invite you home to meet their family and drink wine and play their piano and you know, talk to everyone about your music. You meet someone in the United States. They ask you what you're doing. You say you're a musician or an artist, and they just kind of laugh and go, no, no, what do you really do? Because yeah, nobody that, that, that's that, that TV profession. commercial that that they have. It's like, yo, what are you gonna do uh, to put yourself through school if you're an artist? That's the thinking, exactly. Musicians really struggle. Artists really struggle. So it has to do with arts funding, and part of that. I mean, I was this is crazy, but I was arrested uh, during my own performance at Symphony Hall in Seattle over this issue of the arts not being funded because the mayor's task force. Had started this, he had started this arts task force, only invited the opera and the symphony and all the big players that made big money and had tons of donations anyway and didn't need money to talk about how to fund the arts in Seattle. And so I did a protest during my performance at Benaroy Hall, which is the Seattle Symphony, and they literally arrested me. So it was crazy. But I was able to get the message out there, though, because, of course, the media was all over it. But when I was in Europe, I found a similar kind of thing where I would apply for an arts grant in the United States, um, submitting the same work that was winning me competitions in Europe, and the arts organizations here, including my own local arts organizations, would say, okay, now what is this? Is this music? Is this sound art? What is it? Because I was working with sound collage and this thing called musique concrète, which is a very famous thing in in Europe and in France, where it began, where it was originated by like Pierre Henri and Pierre Schaeffer, who literally brought turntables out and started mixing different sounds together, like DJs, like back in 1947. And you know, so it started this whole school of music where you mix different sounds, even live sound field recordings, sometimes with music. With so while you're hearing the violin, you might hear someone walking up the stair steps or something, which led me into also my love of radio theater, which I'm also doing these days. But the arts organizations didn't understand what was going on. They didn't. They had no clue even about these competitions in Europe. When I went to Europe, the competition and the institute where I was at in Bourges, France, which is about two and a half hours south of Paris by train in the Loire Valley, very beautiful place, surrounded by amazing chateaus and nine art museums in one city, one area. That was partly funded by the French Ministry of Culture and UNESCO from the United Nations. It was considered culturally significant, that whole festival. I have to say, though, Jeff, that later, when the government of France pushed through some austerity measures, there was a funding cuts. That is one thing that happens in Europe, too. When the right wing takes over, when the conservatives take over and they get elected, the first thing they do is they start cutting the arts. So it's they're not uh, immune from it, but in general, there's a much higher regard for artists and musicians. Akhav Havel became, you know, the leader of the Czech Republic. He was a poet. You have... Uh, this attitude in the United States where basically I get this all the time. Everybody I know gets this. Nobody really cares whether your music is very good, but they do care if you're making a lot of money off of it. Now, if you're making a lot of money off of it, then they think you're cool. In Seattle, it's not quite so bad because here people love the underground and they love authentic artists, musicians, and that's why we hang out around the guy that produced Nirvana's first album, Jack Andino. He's in his 70s. He's still out there rocking with like three different bands and stuff. Right. These are authentic people who are very well known, but just not in it really for the money. They're in it because they love music. Right. Good to you too. 
You two just gave ten million dollars for the COVID nineteen campaign against COVID nineteen. So good for them. And musicians and artists have a role in this if they want it. And, and you can hear my quarantine suite, by the way, which is dedicated to all the heroes in this public health crisis, at YouTube or up there at my SoundCloud account. So check it out, quarantine suite. Hey, keep it going, man. I'm glad to see my boys, you two, uh, the Dublin boys, uh, doing the right thing as well. Hey, keep on fighting. Uh, we will talk to you next Tuesday, hopefully at the regular time, 5.30 Eastern, 2.30 Pacific. All the best, Mark. We're right back. Care, it's the Jeff Santos Show. Adios, my man. This may be a podcast. To listen live, we may be on your local radio station. If not, please go to our website, revolutionradionetwork.com. Then click to the Listen Live button. Here you will be able to listen live between 3 and 6 p.m. Eastern Time weekdays, 12 to 3 p.m. Pacific Time on weekdays. You will also be able to listen to the previous day's programs just about any time outside of our normal broadcast hours, including weekends. Another way to listen live is to go to TuneIn and search for GAE-1. This is the GAE, or Global American Enterprises, feed. Global American Enterprises is a syndicator of The Jeff Santos Show. The Jeff Santos Show is brought to you by the Massachusetts Nurses Association, the most powerful and effective voice on nursing and health care in Massachusetts. With more than 23,000 members, including the nurses throughout the Southeast region, the MNA is committed to securing access to quality care in all health care settings with safe staffing levels and health care policies that ensure every patient has access to the care and attention they need when it matters most. To find out more about MNA, visit massnurses.org. This edition of the Jeff Santos Show is brought to you by 116,000 members of the Massachusetts Teachers Association. MTA educators are working together every day to give all students a great public education. The MTA, dedicated to funding our future so that every student can attend the high-quality public schools, colleges, and universities our communities deserve. To find out more, visit teacher.org and be sure to follow the MTA on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.